Hey, uh, to let everybody know, man, we've been in the book of John. We have covered the I am's. And now the book of John, the gospel of John has eight miracles. I wanted to start at the beginning and I wanted to cover all eight miracles on, uh, on Sunday morning. So last week we covered miracle number one. Where Jesus Christ on the third day at a marriage... He turned water into wine. Last week, probably my favorite point was 2 Corinthians 4, 6. There's a verse that says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Earthen vessels, that's a clay pot. And the gospel, Jesus Christ died for us. And if you received him, Jesus moves inside. Your spirit becomes alive. That treasure is inside this old clay pot, man. This earthen vessel. It's a beautiful picture of Jesus say, hey, fill those water pots with water. They filled them to the brim. See, men can fill water pots with water. But you know what men can't do? They can't transform the inside. Jesus turned that water into wine and made it something very, very potent. That was the first miracle in the book of John. And notice it was at a wedding. So you know what a wedding is? Two people living separate from two different families and all of a sudden they unite and they become one. Jesus Christ shows up on the scene and he's developing a relationship with his disciples. That's one of the reasons why I think he told his mom, she's like, hey, they're out of wine. And Jesus Christ said, quit whining. He said, he said, woman, what have I to do with thee? My time's not yet come. And it looks like he's almost being rude to his mom. But you know when you get married, the Bible says you leave father and mother and cleave to each other. That's a real wedding relationship, right? Well, when you meet Jesus Christ, guess what? Your past needs to, to be left behind. Your relationships need to be left behind, and your new relationship with Christ takes over. We're supposed to be different, right, church? As a believer, you should be different. And so that's why he went through all that, and it was the third day. That's the day of resurrection in the Bible. Day three always represents the resurrection. So that was great. That was the first miracle, turning water into wine. Take your Bibles to John chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 46. John chapter 4, and we will start in verse 46. If you're there and ready, say ready. Here we go. John 4, verse 46. Hey, let's do something. We haven't done this for a while. Out of respect for God and His Word, stand to your feet. Let's read this standing up. John chapter 4, verse 46. So Jesus came again into Canaan of Galilee, where He made the water wine. Do you see that? He's come back to the place of the first miracle. And it says, And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. As he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Hey, thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. Wow. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And himself believed and his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Father, teach us this, this miracle. Teach us your word today. Holy Spirit, we can't get this on our own or we're just with our human smarts. Um, we need you to open our eyes. I pray that this miracle would be a miracle for somebody in the room today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Guys, you, you remember <coughs> we talked last week a lot about miracles. Um, and, and basically, um, what we needed to say was, well, it says here, what, what Jesus at some point here said, um, he said, sir, he said, um, except you see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. 
Signs and wonders in verse 48. I talked about that last week and I covered this. We just need to make sure that we're a biblical people. Before the Bible was complete, the Bible says that the Jews required a sign. So uh, often you would see these miracles and signs and wonders. There are times in the Bible where the same word miracle is translated signs. It's the same. And so basically what I want you to see is we're covering these miracles when they're great. But I just want you to know before the Bible was complete, the Jews required a sign. This is why all that wild stuff that you've seen like at the beginning of the book of Acts, the Bible's now complete. The attention has been off of the Jews. They're put on the back burner and the attention's gone to the rest of the world, to Gentiles. These signs have ceased. And a lot of people don't like to admit that. Like, oh, you don't think God can heal? Hey, guys. I 100% believe that God can heal. But I also 100% believe that there is no woman or man walking around the planet that is a divine healer. I don't believe that. I've prayed over people and seen them heal. I've prayed with people and they've died. I'm not the divine one. Right? Right? And there's all these signs, and especially some of the crazier, wild signs that some churches get involved in, and they want to do this and that and that. I just want you to know something, that we're dealing with the time. And Jesus Christ hadn't even resurrected from the grave yet, you know. That's another thing, too. This thing hasn't come to completion, so there's some transition time from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We're in the Gospels, and then we get to the book of Acts, and we're just transitioning. We're transitioning from the nation of Israel to the church of the living God. When you go through a transition like that, you got to be very careful. Well, we just tell people, even in counseling, if you're going through a major transition in your life, emotions are high, life is wild, hey, be careful. Don't make a lot of decisions during times like that. That can get you in some deep trouble. Well, people do that all the time in the Bible. They establish Bible doctrine. Let me tell you something. Uh, let me put this out there, and you can do whatever you want with it. Because, you know, all the Bible... <coughs> All the Bible was written for you and me. But you know, all the Bible wasn't written to you. The whole Old Testament is for the nation of Israel. There's books in this Bible that's like the book of James. James. To the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Nobody in this room is part of the twelve tribes of Israel. That's not to us. Now the book of James is for us. There's things to get out of there. But it's not directly written to us. And people, you, we have got to discern the Bible correctly or you'll be, you'll, you'll be very messed up. So that's why we as a church, you know in the Gospels, most of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's not until the very end Jesus resurrects, meaning the majority of the Gospels are under Old Testament law. You get to the book of Acts, it's still a wild transitional book. The book of Acts is a wild ride. And nobody wants to say this. The book is technically called the Acts of the Apostles. These are the key chosen men by Jesus. There are signs, gifts, and miracles that were done and for the apostles, not for you and me. But people, you, you see that stuff and people get confused. And they just, they, you, you want that stuff. I'm like, hey, read it in context. God's word's pretty clear. So I just wanted to establish that again. As we're talking about the miracles, a lot of churches you'll go to, you'll know you're in like a charismatic or a Pentecostal church when basically they always talk about, we're praying for a miracle today. We need a healing. Does anybody need a breakthrough? Do you need a breakthrough? The, guys, I get it. And I understand that. The problem is, boy, if you get drunk on that, where you're always wanting signs and something supernatural and special, God gave us a book for a reason. Don't ever allow your feelings to override these facts. I know many of people that have been disappointed when the healing did not come. And they're like, what happened? Did you not have enough faith? What's the problem? No, that's life, my friend. I don't know how that always works and why God sometimes seems to choose to heal and sometimes not. Towards the end of the book of Acts, you find the Apostle Paul telling Timothy, hey, take some wine for your stomach because I know you're nervous and you're upset a lot. Take some medicinal medicine for your stomach. Paul cried out three times for the Lord. Lord, let this pass from me. There was a messenger of Satan buffeting him. And you know what God said? No, my grace is sufficient for you. The Apostle Paul, if anybody could heal, you'd think it'd be him. 
And why does the faith healer on TV wear glasses anyway? He can't heal his own eyes. Isn't it crazy? No, just goes to show you. He is not a divine healer. I think he probably knows the divine one that can heal. I'm not saying the guy's like, or, or the gal. I'm not saying they're totally like, basically what I'm saying is they might be family, they might be Christians. They're just crazy. That's all. They're off of the Bible. They're not lining up with the Bible. That's all I'm saying. We all got family members like that. We all got cousins and uncles, right? You, go, you bring your kids to the family reunion, you got kids, and my daughters are like over at me like, they're what, hey, I know, that's your Uncle Mike. He's a little crazy, but he is our uncle. He's family, man. He's just a little nutty, and that's okay. I said that day, Uncle Mike did meet Jesus Christ. And we would still say when we go, Uncle Mike's a little nutty, ain't he? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Okay, you're always paranoid. You know, when I go home, Uncle Mike, he walks around. He used to wear a green beret hat, and he's got a big old thick chest. I'm like, he is going to listen sometime online. When I go home, the first thing I'm going to get is my tail whipped by my Uncle Mike, you know. So, okay, we're in John chapter 4. Are you ready? That's a, all that introduction. Let's go home. It says right here in verse 40, 46 that so Jesus came again into Canaan of Galilee. And notice the next phrase, where he made the water to wine. Guys, we are getting ready to enter second miracle. But notice what it refers to. Jesus came back to the place where he did the first miracle. Guys, I want to tell you something. There's something powerful here to this. Where he made water to wine. Guys, that was a miracle. That was the past. That was history. But God moved. It is so important to remember in history when God moved. It's so important for us. As, now, we read the Bible and you need to see the miracles and the crazy movement of God. But I'm talking about even in your own life. Do you guys remember in 1 Samuel 17, David's getting ready to say, I'll go fight Goliath. I'll whip his tail. Like David's stepping up to the plate like that. And they're like, hey, uh, little boy, I'm not sure you could do it. You know what David said in 1 Samuel 17, 35 and 36? He said... Do you know, I was watching the sheep one time and a lion came out of nowhere. I had to kill it. Once a bear came out to grab the sheep, and, and the Bible says this, I grabbed him by the beard and smote him. Guys, I don't care if it's a little brown bear up in the hills somewhere near a drive from us. Brown bear might only be this tall. You know how strong they are? Grabbed him by the beard and smote him? Yeah, David's like, well, I, I'll fight Goliath because I killed a lion and a bear once. He was using history and what God had already done to say, I know it can be done. There's several verses in the Old Testament that says this, remember the days of old, remember the days of old. My grandfather was drunk, drunk and walked into church, embarrassed the family and sat down and by the end of church, the pastor said, if you need to know Christ, come forward. My grandfather got up, walked forward, got on his knees in front of everybody, crying, and said, Jesus, please save me. My grandpa stood up from the altar, never touched alcohol a day in his life after that day, and he was sober. My father testifies and says, yeah, your grandpa was sober that day. He walked in stumbling drunk, and out. isn't that beautiful? So when somebody comes into our church, and I see it, somebody's like, man, she's messed up. That guy here, habits, addictions. You know what I always say? Hey, I remember in the past, man, I've seen miracles before. So I just want you to know, if there's a habit or a hang-up holding you back today, it don't have to be that way. Jesus can change you. You know what? Let's go back to the spot where Jesus made water into wine. We're going back in history and remembering what, what had taken place. I remember when the Greens came to mind with 18 years ago. I remember that day. Hey, the cooks uh, went to Harrisonville um, again this year. I remember a few years back that trip you made to Harrisonville. Do you remember what they went through? You can ask them about it because I didn't get permission to say it. But guys, I remember that. I get emotional if I think about it, how awful that was. And you know what? They went back. God seen them through. He delivered. It was still tragedy what happened. But I remember that good to go back in history and say God is faithful, God is true. Do you remember uh, Wade, the little Wade Poston? 
They're like, man, we got to get him into surgery. This kid, I mean, he's all jacked up, you know. And all of a sudden, they get in early. This is something that just happened to our church. And you get that surgery done quicker than expected. Hey, do you guys remember? Do you guys remember the Schmidt situation? Do you guys remember when the enemy was out to snuff their life? They've been delivered, man. We got to watch it. It was awful what happened. But guess what? God was victorious. Don't you remember? Don't live under that umbrella. God delivered. They're free. So when you get into a bad spot, remember. Remember that water that turned to wine. Remember the past. I remember the darkest of nights in my family. In that hospital room. And I thought, my gosh, God, what's going to happen to my daughter? She's in Michigan today. You know, she told me, she goes, Dad, we're going to go to the beach this morning and we're going to watch church online. I think we're going to watch Maple City Baptist Church online. So, Josie, if you're watching right now, get your butt in church. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, do you see that? They, Jesus came again in the kingdom of Galilee, and this is where he made water to wine. Just want to encourage you this morning. Maybe you need to do a little glance in the past and just say, I remember. God still delivers. God still changes. Look back, and guys, some of you, you need, to build up a, a, you need to build up a repertoire of memories, a memory book where you can go back and, well, I was just looking the other day, I was looking at the Harrisonville team, people from past. I even looked at Jeff, I said, holy night, you were twice there. Jeff was a big old boy in this picture. And I was like, dude, what happened? Has it, you, you just forget about this. It's good to have those memories to go back and say, because you know, God is real. He still delivers. Amen? So don't, don't get caught up in it today. It, the next thing it says here, there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. A nobleman. You know what a nobleman is? Do I have to explain that? He's a nobleman. He's noble. You know, he's royalty. A nobleman is usually somebody that was connected with kings. Royalty. If you look up this same word, nobleman, in the Bible, it's translated in Acts 12, 20, by the king's country, kings. That's the word nobleman. Chapter 12, verse 21, it talks about he put on king's apparel, royal apparel. So this guy, I'm just telling you, was royal. That's who he was. But notice what it says. There's a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. His son was sick. Matter of fact, he says later on to Jesus, he says, if you don't come, my son's going to die. It's obvious by this context, his son had a fever and they could not get it down. Guys, this is royalty. Kings have the best health care. Right? <clears throat> Seems like people with money, and we know this just from Josephine, if you just walk in with state aid, they're like, yeah, yeah. It's... And you know why. Because they don't get paid. Clinics and hospitals don't get paid near as much when dealing with government money. And the government will come in and file through all their file systems. Say, so we just need to do a 5% audit. They'll audit 5% of their files, and if they find one mistake, they're like, now you're under full audit. What? Now we're in trouble. And, and then they can say, well, since this was a mistake here, a mistake here, I know we owe X amount of money, you're not getting it. That's how it works. Well, I'll tell you right now, we might be under state aid. Some of you in here might not have any insurance or good insurance at all. There was no excuse for this nobleman. They were kingly, man. Royalty. They had the best of the best. You know what this tells us, guys? Sin, sickness, and death, it doesn't discriminate. It lands on the poor, and it lands on the rich. Doesn't it? Wow. This is why this nobleman very kingly, comes to Jesus and says, you've got to come down and heal my son. A lot of people don't realize this, no matter how much money you have. At the end of the day, you know who you and me are? We're, we live in, we're Burlington Northern people. This is where we live. We're all like boxcars. You ever drive by Galesburg and you just see boxcars on a track? You know what a boxcar is? It's just an empty boxcar. You don't have no engine in it. It's sitting there waiting to be loaded with something. That's what boxcars are. They have no juice. They have no power. A boxcar needs attached to an engine. It needs something greater to be able to pull it. 
That's who we are. This nobleman recognized that. And the best health care, and he's like, my son is going to die. What do I do? You got one option, my friend. He went where the power source was. He was going to hook his boxcar to a real locomotive, the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, it's sad, but you know we know this. Money don't heal, does it? It can buy medicine. It can maybe afford some better, but fame, all that fame don't heal. It doesn't heal at all. People think important people and all. You know, I love the book of Romans because Romans starts off and basically says, it, it convinces everybody in, in three chapters that everybody's under sin. And it deals with three types of sinners. But one is a vile sinner. You know, oh, you're all messed up. You've made bad decisions. You're on your second, third, fourth marriage. you got a dope habit in your life. Yeah, 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 it's bad. I know I'm a sinner. Get off of it, man. The second person in Romans chapter 2 comes along. And you know what the Bible says? Who are who art thou that judges, O oh man? That's how it starts off. There's a sinner in Romans chapter 2 that judges other sinners thinking they are better. There's people out there that think they're better than you. We were up on that St. Jude's floor, man, with our daughter. And I'll tell you what. There was families poorer than us, and there was families richer than us. We were all dropping the same tears. We were in trouble. I was looking to hook my box car up to an engine, man. I'm like... Oh my gosh, this is not going to go well left to ourselves, right? Now, some people will confuse this story with another story in the Gospels of a centurion. A centurion, uh, matter of fact, I say this, and me and my wife are talking about it. She goes, oh, that's that story. I say, wrong story. The centurion had a servant that was sick. Do you remember that? If, you, if you're quick, go back to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. In verse 8. Well, not verse 8. It'll be uh, verse 5. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 5. And when Jesus entered into Capernaum, 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 well, I'll say it. there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. Check this out. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. I'm a man under authority, but having soldiers under me. I say to this man, go, and he goeth to another. Come, he cometh. And this guy's servant. It's his servant, not his son. But he cares for him. He's, he's a centurion. He's a military man. He says, I'm under authority, but I also have guys under me. And, and, and Jesus said, well, I'm going to come down. And what did he say? I am not worthy that you come in my house. Now, if we're over in John chapter 4, notice it says, verse 47. It says, and when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son. He's beseeching Jesus, come and heal my son, for he was at the point of death. Look at verse 48 in John chapter 4. Then said Jesus unto him, except ye see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Like, oh, you're telling me to come down? I need to touch your son. You need to see it or you're not going to believe. Because Jesus knows how the Jews are. Verse 49, the nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Do you see the difference between the centurion and the nobleman? The nobleman's like, Sir, I don't know how to say this. Come down or my son's going to die. The centurion's like, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come to my house. If you just say the word, he believed. He believed. You know, most people seeing is believing. You'll find out there's a principle in the Bible. You don't see until you believe. Now, I'm not talking even about healing. But you don't see things until you say you believe. It's amazing to me that people that don't think the Bible is true, then they get saved and start studying the Bible, and they're blown away by the Bible. Like, I thought this book was written and tainted by man. Well, every, anybody that ever says that to me, I'm like, well, you've never read it. You've never studied it. I've read some of it. Oh, good job. I've looked at the pictures of magazines before, too. But what in the world are you talking about, my friend? So this nobleman is saying, hey, uh, but, oh, and you can see the difference because the nobleman's coming down, like, and saying, 
No, come up. He's going to die. Come. And uh, do you guys remember John chapter 3? Do you remember Nicodemus, the rich r ruler? And like, it says he approached Jesus by night. Because you know there's a bunch of scabs, man, a bunch of poor people coming to Jesus by day, asking questions, you know, out in front of everybody. This guy's like, okay, everybody's in bed. I got to go find Jesus. He didn't want anybody to see it. It's amazing to me how you see a difference in people. But at the end of the day, the nobleman's son was sick to death. Because you know what the Bible says? All of sin comes short of the glory of God. Everybody deals with this, right? So the nobleman's like, come down. Come down or he's going to die. Just a little bit different. And so it says, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at, where was he sick at? Capernaum, right? Is it Capernaum or Capernaum? Capernaum. That's what we're going to say today. It's Capernaum. It's Capernaum. In, in Abonics. That's what it is. And so, notice he was sick. You know, sick in the Bible, you're weak, you are feeble. We notice all sickness eventually started when the first sin entered the planet, but it's not necessarily because somebody sinned. Now we just live in a contaminated world, man. You're just going to get it, you know. And so, but I want you to know what's beautiful about this story. I, I, I like this because Jesus speaks the word. Because do you realize when you study sickness in the Bible, like in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says, I remember, you know, cups of cold water in Jesus' name. When I was sick, you visited me. To have a visit. Luke chapter 4, he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Jesus touched people and healed them. And Matthew chapter 8, Jesus went up and touched the untouchable, a leper. He touched him. The touch of Jesus. What we find here is Jesus speaks the word and says, Go thy way, your son liveth. The spoken word of Jesus Christ. Guys, do you realize when the planet was being created, Jesus didn't come down and grab some Play-Doh and just start working it and putting it together, you know? He didn't do that. The Bible says when you see at the beginning, even in Genesis, if you just go to Genesis, he steps up and the first words out of his mouth is like, Hey, let there be light. And you know what happened? The light came on. Let there be light. And there was light. This is who we're dealing with here. The creator of the universe. And I know everybody wants the touch. But if you had to take the works versus the word. People do this all the time. They want to work their way to salvation, start behaving. Or you can just simply believe the word. I'll take the word every day of the week. Man. Jesus is proving a beautiful point here too. His works are best done with his word. He spoke it and bam! The kid lived and was healed. Notice it was at Capernaum. This village... Do you know what this title of Capernaum means? You might want to write this one down. This is money. The village of comfort. The village of comfort. This nobleman had a sick kid at Capernaum. Because you know one thing money can buy. It can buy a little comfort, can it? No? No? I remember I was searching for an economy car one time, and so I got on the internet. And I'm like, man, I need an economy car, and I need one that's like, I don't want to hear road noise, you know. Like, I want one that's the door sealed tight, you know. I, 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 this sounds arrogant and stupid, but I was looking for one with leather interior, too, you know. Like, can I just get like a Corolla that's just, mm, you know, leather interior? You know, the, the results I came to was, it uh, doesn't exist to have an economy car where it's super quiet. Then you get into somebody's higher end vehicle. You're like, this is a nice ride, man. It is quiet in this thing, isn't it? Yeah, somebody paid some money for that comfort. It comes at a price, don't it? So I noticed they're at Capernaum because it is human nature. Human nature seeks comfort. Human nature seeks security. Human nature seeks the familiar. 
That's exactly what human beings do. And so this guy, rich dude, got a boy, and guess what? He's in the village of comfort, and check this out. He's still sick. He's still sick. Ain't that something? I always think of you and me being men and women of faith. You know, faith is risky. That's why most people don't want to live it. You've got to risk something with faith. You step forward and make decisions, and you don't know what's on the other side. Most people will not do that. They'll wait till they see it. And then they'll believe. You know, faithful people will believe what God has said. And they'll wait for the day for that to happen. It's called faith for a reason. That's why Revelation 3 says, yeah, you, you church, let out a scene church. You're lukewarm. You just want to be comfortable. Everybody wants to be comfortable. It's human nature. So that's what this guy was. These rich folks here. They're, uh, but I'll tell you right now, he knew this rich dude left the place of comfort and went to find Jesus. He knew who to go to. It's kind of like having roaches in your house. Anybody have roaches in your house? Don't raise your hand. That's probably not a good thing. <laughs> I've had roaches in our house. Um, I, I, matter of fact, when I lived in the government projects room, there was a lady next door. Her name was Rita. You wouldn't believe the roaches in that house. I was like, how in the world this place needs burnt to the ground? I got news for you. If you find a roach in your house, you know what you do? Just go to the grocery store, get yourself a can of raid. And you see it, psh, he'll die. That's how it works. But the negative part to this is, is if you find a roach or two in your house, what you see behind walls is magnified. Right? That's just what you see. And so don't think by getting a little can of rage you're going to do well. It's like having ants on the counter. Don't open your drywall up. They're coming from somewhere. That's just what you see, my friend. So somebody that really knows what they're doing, if you start seeing a roach in your house, hey, and by the way, roaches come. Like seriously, if the house next door fumigated or burnt to the ground, all their bugs are going to wander over into your yard and into your house. It don't mean that you're disgusting. But some if you're disgusting, get rid of the clean the place, you know, do that type of stuff. But it just happens. So what you do is somebody that really sees a roach or two or what's this, I'm not going to tell you what I found this morning in my basement. I'm not lying. Oh, my gosh, it's a crazy story. I'll tell you after church. I look at all these roaches. What you see, you can kill. But if you're anywhere wise, you've got a problem on your hand. A can of raid will only deal with what's seen. It's cheap. It's marketing. It's garbage. I mean, you can spray vinegar on a dang roach and it'll kill it. But the issue is, it's what you can't see. So call a professional. Call the professional in, man. Call somebody that does this for a living so they can find cracks, they can find crevices, they can get stuff behind walls that you can't get to. This is what I love about this nobleman. His son's dying, and now all of a sudden, he even left the place of comfort to go and say, my gosh, this boxcar is getting hooked up to an engine, man. I need some help here. i got to get a professional. Well, you know why? Because the roaches are everywhere. Oh, he's sick, even though he's in a place of comfort. And Jesus Christ had to say, except you see the signs and wonders, you're not going to believe. Yeah, that's a typical Jew for you, really. And so you know what happens next in the passage. <clears throat> the guy says, Sir, come down ere my child die. Please come. And Jesus said to him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. Jesus spoke the word, the man believed. I want you to know something. It says the man believed the word. Jesus spoke the word and the kid was healed. If you think for a second... The man's belief had something to do with the healing. You're wrong. Every time Jesus in the word heals, every time regardless. There were some guys that Jesus healed and the guy's like, Lord, I believe, but I don't believe. Man, can you help my unbelief? Jesus healed anyways. Jesus healed 100% of the time. Mark it. These faith healers today on TV, let me tell you what they want. They want your money is what they want. That's all about money. That's all that is. It's a business. 
Jesus Christ heals all of Jesus' word. You know, God's word is the authority. Did you know God's word is certain? He says it, it's true. You better believe it, but you don't have to. It's true anyway. Ain't that crazy? This book's preserved. I believe that. Do you? God preserved it. It's infallible. I believe the Bible does not have errors. It's true. You know, the Bible shows itself in it, its types of many different things in the, in the Word. And I love this because Jesus spoke his word to this man and his son was healed. Jesus spoke his word. Did you know the Bible in Hebrews 4.12 says it's called the sword, Ephesians 6. It's the sword of the Spirit. The Bible's called a sword. Do you realize that? Does anybody in this room need some surgery? Because I know of a sword, right? Does anybody in here need somebody killed? Well, that sounds terrible, don't it? I know of a sword. It divides, too. You need a little separation in your life from something that's really toxic? There's a sword. This is it. The word of Jesus. Jeremiah 23, 29 calls the Bible a hammer. God's word is like a hammer. Anybody in here need something put together? I need something put together in my life, man. Things are falling to pieces. Hey, I know a hammer. God's word. Jesus' word here. What about a seed? 1 Peter 1, 23 calls it the seed, incorruptible. Does anybody here say, man, I need some growth in my life? It's right here. And I just don't see accurately. Well, you know what the Bible's called a mirror in James 1, 22. You don't see yourself for what you really are. It's hard to admit. It's hard to see that. If you'll be honest, God says, man, I'll help you out. And it'll, it'll be the mirror that you need to see. Or it's called fire. Fire in Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. Fire purifies. It also destroys. You know what some of you need to do this afternoon? You need to light a match. Some of you hoarders in the room, you need to just take stuff out the front yard and light a match. Burn that. It's going to burn anyway. You need to get rid of that stuff. Some of you say, no, but on the inside, i got a lot of junk in my life and a lot of thought processes. You know, I've been through a lot of trauma in my life. I know a fire. It'll clean that up. It'll clean that up. Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light. A lamp, man, Psalms 119. Some of you just say, my gosh, I'm just depressed. I always feel darkness. Left to yourself, you're always going to be in darkness. You need a light. I know of a light. Does anybody know of a light in the room? I know of a light. You know, it's the Bible. Jesus is word. Jesus, you need to come down or my son's going to die. Oh, yeah? Right now, I'm telling you, he's li he lives. Just based upon your word? It's that powerful. Ephesians 5.26 calls the word water. Washing of the water by the word. Water. Anybody thirsty? I just feel parched all the time. Like nothing satisfies me. My friend. My friend. I'm just dirty. You don't know the things I've done. I know some water will clean you right up. Well, it starts with blood. Well, what you mean, Jesus Christ? That's the water of the word. Amen? What about silver? Anybody poor in here? The Bible's called silver. It's called food. Anybody hungry? You need some substance in your life? Isn't it beautiful? God's word. This God's word. Jesus said, bam, son, healed. Done. The man believed the word Jesus had spoken to him and he went his way. The next thing I love here is I love it says, and as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, said, hey, thy son liveth. This, he's going back to Capernaum. To Capernaum. Sorry. And then the servant came back and met him halfway just to say, I got news for you. He's alive. Your son's alive. Hey, don't you like in the first miracle, the water to wine? Like the richest people there didn't know what happened, but the servants did. When Jesus said, hey, servants, fill up those water pots. They were on the front row. They got to help and partake in the miracle. This second miracle that we see here, isn't it awesome? The servants get to come back and deliver the news. I like that. Something about being a servant in the Bible. You know who makes the best leaders? Servants. That's exactly right. So we see here he comes up, man, your son lives. The water has become wine. 
We're delivering the good news. And so what did the man do? He inquired then at the hour. What hour did this happen? They said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said to him, thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. Two more things, I'm going to end this thing. I'm going to land this airplane right now. Pay attention. This is the main point coming up right now. This nobleman needed a miracle. How do we know that? Well, because his son was sick. His son was going to die. See, he had a big problem on his hands. All of the doctors, all of the money, all of the royalty, all of the place of comfort, they couldn't make him comfortable enough. The Bible says his fever was spiked high and it was going to kill him. Mm. You ready? Here's the big point. You'll never get a miracle if you never have a problem. Meaning, if you have deep, heavy problems in your life today, you are now candidate for a miracle. All this started off with a big issue of trouble. My son's going to die. His fever's high. We can't get it done. Problems demand, and they welcome the miraculous. Of course, the big one is for us, we always talk about Josie having the cancer. That was huge for us. And some of you have lost spouses in the room. And you need Jesus. Some of you are riddled with anxiety. I'm just an anxious person. All I'm depressed, all I see is darkness in my life. candidate for a miracle. I just want you to know that, man. Some of you don't know where your job's going to come from. You're uncertain about it. Some of your children are struggling. Some of you have children that are special needs. They struggle in another way. Hey, listen, Mom. You're a candidate for a miracle. You're a candidate. Some of you got money trouble. Some of you don't know how you're going to get your car repaired. I've been there. Some of you are single and you want to be married. How's that going to happen? You're a candidate for a miracle. Some of you are married and want to be single. And you're a candidate for a miracle. God knows your spousal situation. He knows your pain. Some of you, all you can do is see the past. You can't even get a glimpse of the future. Your past holds you back so bad. Guess what, my friend? you got a major problem in your life. You're a candidate for a miracle. But your old boxcar is lifeless. It ain't going nowhere on the rails of life until you hook it to the engine, until you hook it to some power. Some of you got fear, you're worried. Some of you have no confidence at all, none. Guess what? You're a candidate for a miracle. Hey, I want to share uh, something with you in closing. You know, Matthew 13, you'll see different stories being told by Jesus. But he tells this one about a pearl. He calls it the pearl of great price. Anybody ever heard that phrase? The pearl of great price in the Bible? Proverbs 31 talks about her price is above rubies, you know. And so, a pearl. A pearl. <laughs> you know, a pearl, even though the Bible says it's a pearl of great price. The price above rubies. You know, a pearl is like an organism. You know, and what happens is, you know, you got some kind of clam or some set of conch, some kind of creature that's at the bottom of a dirty place, usually in muddy places. And all of a sudden, something gets inside. It's an organism, but what enters is sometimes, and people always, I like to think a grain of sand, but sometimes it's just, a parasite. A parasite comes in and says, my gosh, we're in trouble here. So all of a sudden, this organic material, all of a sudden, inside the oyster, it begins to secrete. It begins to put a type of, we would think of like calcium, around this parasite. we got to protect ourselves from this irritant. It's deep down inside, and it takes quite a long time. And eventually, 
if you can crack the right one or the right conch, if you can get a right pearl, it's worth so much money, or a black pearl is really rare and unique, <laughs> worth so much money. And you know how it started? It started with a problem. It started with an issue. And all of a sudden, it just took some time. And all of a sudden, the Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 11, the favorite head ornament or necklace for kings and queens are pearls. So valuable. I want you to know this today. Sometimes you can only see your problem. Just like we're looking at this miracle here. And this is heavy stuff. What's going to happen? And hey, hook your box cart onto the engine. I'm telling you, let the Lord do His work, man. Take your problem to the right place and allow the miraculous to happen. I'm not saying your problems disappear. And I'll tell you this much, but God will give you the strength and the fortitude. You will not believe where you're at in a week from now, let alone a month from now, let alone a year from now. And someone would just say, my gosh, you must be privileged looking at that pearl necklace you're wearing. Oh, sweetie. Every one of these pearls started off as a parasite. This has not been good. Some of you never see miracles. You know why? It's all about Capernaum for you and comfort. You'll never deal with it. You'll get far away from your problems. That agitation and irritation that God wants to use in your life to say, hey, here I am. I'm very much alive. This was so powerful. Here this kingly, this royal guy goes home. Not only did he hear your son live, but he goes home, his son's alive. It says at the end here that he believed. And then it says this, and his whole house. You know why Christians oftentimes, they, their kids go wayward. Pastors are the worst. Their families and their kids end up just becoming hellions. Man. You know a lot of times why it is? We don't want them to suffer. We just protect them from anything bad. We give them what they want. They whine, cry, we give it to them, right? Because we just want there to be peace. And instead of being a good leader and taking our issues and our problems and saying, folks, we need a Savior my daughters need to see that their dad needs a savior. Their dad needs a hero. And they see our problem. We try to even hide our problems from them. Like, we don't want them to know that, you know. But guess what? Since we try to hide and keep it from them, they never get to experience the miracle on the other side. What we need to be is we need to be a people like this nobleman that goes down we go to Jesus Christ, you know? You ever, you ever go to a real pizzeria place? Like, you go in there, and usually, I don't know, it smells great in there. You don't know what's totally happened. But there's always somebody back there, and they're like, what? That! I mean, somebody's back there beating a chunk of dough to pieces. Every once in a while you'll get the privilege. Have you ever seen somebody throw it up and like do the spin thing? I've seen it. Like that's kind of cool. But, the, but I go in and I, you know what I want? I want sausage. I want pepperoni. I want the cheese. I'm not a big sauce guy so much, but I like the meat. I want the meats on there. But guess what? You ain't getting no meats until the dough's ready. And it's a process, man. There's dough for tomorrow and they're still rising. There's all kinds of weird things in there growing and making that thing happen. And then somebody's got to put it in their hands and work it and press it and beat it and throw it down and crack it. And I'm here to tell you, gang, put yourself in his hands. Just put your life in his hands. And you know what I say? The sauce is coming, man. The meats are coming. It will. The miracle's going to happen. But it's going to take some pressure. It's gonna, this guy here is beside himself. It would make a man of royalty hum humble himself. So the real issue is here, if you're a guy or a girl that's privileged in royalty, I would say drop the royalty and pick up loyalty yeah. to the creator of the universe. Where does your loyalty lie? 
where do your problems go? Will you just fix it yourself? No, I got myself in this mess. I'll just get myself out. Okay, you'll be struggling next week. I just don't want to say something. I know you're busy, so I just don't want to say, there's people who got bigger problems than me. But no, your problem is relative. The parasite in your world, it's relative. We get in God's word, the Spirit of God working, God's spoken word, and you're going to say, my gosh, that's exactly what I needed. It might take some time. And sometimes that beautiful pearl, people look and say, and he's lucky. You see the beautiful jewelry they're holding, that beautiful pearl? Folks, it came at a great, great price. It came at a great price. Let's bow our heads today and let's pray. I don't know what part of this message spoke to your heart, but just own it and deal with it. That's what you need to do. And I, I hope today you're encouraged as you walked in. We all have a, issues and a plethora of things that could be better in our lives, right? You think this, but it takes problems. It really takes problems for us to see any sort of miracle. You don't see the miraculous unless you, you have something that needs the miracle worker. That's Jesus, right? Some of you need to humble yourself and take it to him. Quit trying to make people comfortable. I got news for you. You can make your kid as comfortable they want on the couch, but if they got a 104 temperature, you better deal with the issue. There's a virus coming there going crazy. That needs dealt with. Oh, get her another blanket. Oh my gosh, do you want something to drink, sweetie? Hey, I get it. We're trying to bring comfort to people, but it ain't comfort that brings healing. It's Jesus. It's the healer. So I, I don't know what part spoke to you. Some of you, you need the miracles in your life, which means you need the problems. Would you welcome them and realize this is life? God's at work. We always... Hey, Jesus is the God for the miracle for sure. But guys, Jesus is there in the problem. Right? He's there. What are you hiding from him for? And then your family, your whole house will see that, man, our God is real. Maybe some of you just need to hear the word servant again today. Because you've been living so arrogantly. You know, no, be the servant. These servants get to play great pieces and parts inside of these, uh, these miracles, and I love it. You got roaches in your house? You know what some of you need to do? Put away the can of rape. It's just temporarily working. Just temporarily. You need a professional. I know the professional. And yet most of you know him too. Lord, thank you for your word today. Thanks for this second miracle that we've seen. Lord, I'm thankful we were able to look back at the first miracle. And we were at the same place where you turn water to wine. May we be convinced today that you're true and that you're real. May we start growing in our faith today. Jesus, we love you. Amen.